Welcome to Melt, I'm Suresh Venkat. This week we are plugging into the gaming world. Long believed to be a tertiary option for marketers, the global gaming industry today is valued by research firms at over $300 billion. That's greater than the global film, music and American sports industries combined. Naturally, the size dictates that the industry can't be ignored by brands and marketers. To know more, we're in conversation with Fernando Machado, Chief Marketing Officer of Activision Blizzard, the global gaming company acquired by Microsoft. What are the opportunities in gaming and why should brands care? Let's find out as we get ready to melt with Fernando Machado. So Fernando Machado, from burgers to gaming, tell us about this new shift in your life. Well, first of all, thanks for having me. Um, it's always a pleasure to uh, to join uh, to join you guys, and uh, I will take every opportunity to connect. So uh, um, it's a shame we couldn't make the time in Cannes, uh, but we are doing like a follow up, and I'm very happy to be here. So yeah, from from burgers to gaming, like look, I mean, um, to be honest with you, I was always like very passionate about gaming. Like uh, I have every single game I think you can name. Like uh, I play video games since I was a, a little kid. So I was always very curious about the industry. Uh, and I saw gaming as an industry uh, that was growing a lot, uh, that became huge, that completely transformed from uh, when little Fernando used to play Mario Bros uh, to uh, what it became uh, uh, today. Um, I, I had a long experience in CPG, in consumer goods. I spent a little bit over seven years on Restaurant Brands International. And I, and I always wanted to work um, on something that was closer to entertainment, something that was digitally native. Uh, I, I did a lot of work in terms of digital transformation on RBI and even on Unilever, uh, but um, uh, working in gaming gives me the opportunity to work on something that's purely digital. Um, and, uh, and it was something that I thought uh, would help me learn a lot, would put myself again outside of my comfort zone uh, after the change from CPG to uh, QSR with RBI. So, um, so yeah, so I was always very passionate about it. Uh, I think that the industry is amazing. Uh, I think it was, it's an opportunity to learn a lot, which kind of like is one of the key drivers of my, uh, my choice in terms of my career. We have amazing franchises at Activision Blizzard. Uh, the people I've met, uh, were great during the whole process. So I took the leap of faith. Uh, uh, and, uh, even though, um, the RBI team is a great team and amazing brands with Burger King, Tim Hortons, and Popeyes. I thought it was a, a it was a good opportunity to uh, to do something different. Um, and I've been uh, with Activision Blizzard now for a year and a half, uh, more or less. And I'm getting exactly what I was looking for, which is learning a lot uh, and having the opportunity to work with some of the most beloved franchises in the gaming industry. But the problem is, Fernando, people keep telling us. At least they keep telling me that. People like us, we're too old to work in new age businesses like gaming and the metaverse. Do you feel old in this role? Um, I, I don't like, uh, and I think that we like, uh, I truly believe that um, if you have a diverse set uh, of people with different experiences uh, working on something, uh, you will probably be able to come up with, uh, uh, with more creative solutions. Like uh, I think that gaming, some people don't realize how, um, uh, the, how broad the reach of gaming is, you know, like uh, depending on who you ask, maybe some people have the misconception that gaming is just for younger generations, uh, or uh, some people may think that gaming is more, uh, it's just like for guys, it's just very male. Uh, and it's not the case, you know, like gaming became uh, almost like uh, more social than social media in terms of bringing people together, uh, in terms of like helping people connect with others, and I think that because of that, you end up like reaching all sorts of demographics. Uh, it's very gender balanced. I mean, if you look at the whole industry, uh, of course, some franchises may have uh, a center of gravity that are more male than female and vice versa. But if you look at the whole industry, it's very much divided male, female, uh, and it crosses all ages. Um, and I do think that having someone coming uh, with like a, a strong marketing background, like like I had uh, throughout my career, uh, and and bringing a different perspective than the people who have worked in gaming for so long helps. You know, it helps me to learn from them. It also helps them to learn a little bit from me. I I, I truly invest time to make sure my team is diverse. 
you know, like uh, in terms of experience, in terms of age, in terms of gender, in terms of ethnicity, in terms of background, because I believe that when you accomplish that, and I don't think you ever accomplish that, it's always like a, a, a something that you achieve, but the more diverse your team is, the more creative it will be. Uh, and I do believe that the more creative the team is, the better uh, work we will do uh, in terms of coming up with ideas that will drive the brand and the business. So I don't think there is such thing as being too old for something, whether that's in gaming or in, a, in another industry. Fernando, not many people know that the gaming industry is actually bigger than the mu movie and the music industries combined. That's how big gaming is. Yeah. What do marketers yeah. get to know about the key drivers of this business? Yeah, I think it's funny because like when, when I told my friends that I was moving from fast food uh, to gaming, they were all like very excited about that change because they know how much I love gaming like uh, since before. Uh, and it was funny to hear them saying things like, oh, that's great. It's a super exciting industry. It's growing a lot. It's going to be really big in the future. And I was like, what do you mean? It's already big now. You know what I mean? Like, and as you said, uh, uh, depending on the source you look, uh, it's actually larger than linear, uh, linear TV and, and movies and even like music all combined. I think that gaming today is very different than what it was when uh, we were kids uh, and we used to play video game. You know, like I think that there is a quote from the New York Times that I really love, which is something around the lines of um, in the past, we were friends and that's why we play video game together. And today uh, we play video game together and that's how we became friends. You know, like uh, uh, if you look at the reasons why people play, they're all related to meeting new people, connecting with friends. The reasons why people stop playing is many times that their friends stop playing. So it's very social in nature. You know, like it really brings people together and it brings people together converging to the same interest, whether that interest is for you to play virtual nerf on Call of Duty or slay dragons of World of Warcraft. Like uh, people have the same interest and the game is built to help people cooperate, interact. Uh, um, and, uh, and I think that's why uh, uh, that's why it, it plays such an important role in people's life. It, it, it depending on the game, it helps. Uh, uh, it's part of their identity. You know, they really um, people tend to really like uh, uh, associate themselves with their characters uh, or with the character that they build. Uh, uh, so it's really part of people's lives and uh, uh, and a way to connect with other people. Uh, and that's why I think when you look at the numbers, I think it's just part of the story. I think that the level of engagement is another part of the story. You know, the, the amount of time people spend playing. Uh, it's huge. The engagement in terms of the love they have for the franchise, uh, uh, most people feel like the franchise belongs to them. Uh, you know what I mean? Like it's, it belongs to the community. The communities uh, of each game is like very, very strong. And it's unlike anything I have ever seen, you know, like uh, in consumer goods or uh, uh, or even like in QSR. And, and I did work with some very strong brands. So I think that those are kind of like some of the reasons why uh, gaming became the... the, the like the, the massive uh, market. Like you said, the community feels like the games belong to them and they are the actual owners of the game. My question to that is, does, does using gaming as an advertising medium by advertisers or marketers upset the loyal fans of the game? Do they get pissed off that, that the game is being used as a device to sell them goods and services? I think it always depends on how it's done, right? I mean, uh, I think it's very different if you want to connect to the community uh, of gamers uh, uh, I don't think that necessarily what you have done with TV advertising or out of home or radio or even social is necessarily what's going to work for you. One critical thing that people need to understand is that uh, the gamers are active doing something. You know, like, so for instance, when you go and you advertise during a football match, you know, like everyone is watching the game and then you serve them an ad. Uh, uh, when you advertise in gaming, you are advertising for the people who are playing that football match. You know, it's very different. Like, uh, they are not the audience. Like, they are actively engaged. Uh, in fact, the name Activision comes from that, right? I mean, when you had TV, it was just vision. Uh, and when you have a game, it's active vision. People are engaged in doing something uh, as part of the game. So um, I think that just assuming that uh, interrupting that behavior with a message uh, of a product, as much as the product may be great, it might not necessarily be uh, the best path forward. 
You know, like I think that the best path forward is when you really understand, um, first identify like uh, which game overlaps with your the audience that you're trying to reach, because I'm sure there is a game out there uh, for your brand. Then really understand what that game is about and understand what makes the community tick. Um, and then understand what your brand is good at uh, and try to leverage that to make the experience for gamers better. I think that if you go with that mindset, uh, you will increase your chances of doing something that the community will uh, uh, will embrace uh, and not just something that's going to bother uh, people who are playing the game. Fernando, many marketers probably watching this show, especially those from the older generation, have never played World of Warcraft or Call of Duty. Do you suggest that they play a little bit to understand more about this, these alternate realities? I do. Like, I, well, first of all, it, the, the games are really fun, uh, and uh, and you may enjoy uh, more so than you expect. Um, I think that there are lots of games out there uh, today that don't require a massive investment for you to have a, a sample uh, of that. Like, uh, you could start maybe playing Diablo Immortal, which is a title that we launched like a couple of weeks ago. It's a free-to-play game. Uh, it's mobile. Uh, that's the other thing. I think that investing in mobile and and and, uh, and uh, monetization models that are free to play also helps us increase the reach because it diminishes the barriers uh, to entrance. Right? I mean, I'm Brazilian. Not everyone in Brazil uh, will have money to have a gaming PC or a PlayStation Five, but everyone has a smartphone. Uh, maybe start with Candy Crush, which is also a game uh, uh, that we have. There are plenty of choices there. If you if you have a PlayStation or an Xbox. Try Warzone. I, I see a lot of people talking about Metaverse and Web3. Like many of those things, they are part of the reality of gaming for the past 10, 15, maybe 20 years. You know, like so uh, uh, as a marketeer, I, I, I definitely think you, you will learn something uh, if you try to immerse yourself a little bit in the world of gaming. Uh, so at worst, you're going to learn something. And at best, you will discover a new passion point. <laughs> Uh, and have a great time connecting with other people and with friends, because I'm sure you're afraid that you have friends that are playing, uh, uh, and you'll be surprised uh, uh, how fun it is. So, Fernando, where exactly is this metaverse, and what does one do in it? <laughs> like, I think that it became such a buzzword, right? I mean, thanks yeah. to thanks to our friends at Meta slash Facebook. Uh, to be honest with you, like, my I think that my first experience with uh, metaverse. Uh, uh, was like uh, when I played uh, Second Life uh, back in, when was that? It's like a the late 2000s, 90s, early 2000s, yeah. Yes, it was, for, for, for me, it was around 2005, 2006. Mm -hmm. I'm sure it, it probably existed before that. Uh, and that to me was already the metaverse. You know, like when, when I look at World of Warcraft, when I look at Warzone, when I look at Fortnite, which is not a game from an Activision Blizzard, but all these games, they uh, Roblox, uh, Minecraft, sorry, they create worlds where people can connect with others, you know, and you can transact in some of these games. Like you can have business, you can have brands. So uh, that reality is uh, prevalent in gaming for many, many years. Uh, so that's why I'm saying that maybe uh, if you are interested in Web3 and all that good stuff, like look at gaming because I think that gaming may be ahead uh, uh, of the curve uh, when it comes to all these topics. You know, like it, they are not new uh, uh, for people in the industry or for people who play video games. Many of your blockbuster games uh, are based on wars of some kind or the other. Your latest one, Vanguard, is based on World War II. What explains the gaming industry's f enduring fascination with war? Um... Like I think that there are there are there are different games. Like depends on like the the genre uh, uh, of the game, right? I mean, Call of Duty uh, is a game based in conflict and war. Um, I think that when people play, they are not necessarily thinking about war. You know, like uh, to me, it's almost like playing uh, virtual Nerf. You know, like uh, uh, with friends. Uh, it's just kind of like a way to connect. Um, and uh, uh, and I think that Call of Duty brings out this kind of like brave spirit uh, uh, of people that maybe in real life they, they might not be as brave, but like on the game, they can afford uh, uh, to do that. Um, but we have a range of games, right? I mean, World of Warcraft is very different. Like it's much more like a, a fantasy world, which is Azeroth, uh, where you have dragons, you have mythical creatures. 
uh, it's not a, a shooter uh, necessarily. You have Candy Crush, uh, which is more like a, a match puzzle game, which is uh, a game that people enjoy playing that gives you a kick uh, every time you play. We have games for all tastes, you know, like I think that shooters or first person shooters or third person shooters like Fortnite is like uh, they uh, they create a good competition among friends. They help make, bring friends together. So I think that's probably why uh, 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 they exist for so long and why people are so fascinated about playing those games. You spoke about Candy Crush just now. Now, it's a game that you acquired. It has over 200 million monthly active users. Uh, it's immensely popular in India. Yeah. Frankly, it's quite a silly game. You're crushing pieces of candy. <laughs> what explains the incredible popularity and the addictiveness of Candy Crush? Yeah. So Candy Crush, uh, his star, Candy Crush is turning 10 years old this year. Uh, and uh, it has more than 3 billion downloads uh, historically, uh, which probably means that everyone in the world or most of the population in the world was uh, is a Candy Crush player or is a lapsed Candy Crush player because like at some point you probably had it on your phone. Um, and I think that like I think it's a game that like uh, um, in a world where uh, we are we tend to be anxious and rushing uh, and worried and like uh, and many times if you turn on the news it's kind of like a little bit doom and gloom uh, depending on the channel you're watching. Uh, uh, Candy is like a, a fun break from all that, you know, like and it really gives you a kick. Uh, as you are making progress on the game and uh, uh, and people tend to really enjoy uh, playing. You know, like I think that that's that's why I think that game, uh, the, the approach for gamer for gaming needs to be democratic, right? I mean, if you want to play World of Warcraft, it takes hours and hours and hours uh, uh, of gameplay for you uh, uh, to be good at it. Uh, Candy Crush is very easy. You can hit the ground running uh, and you'll have a good time. So um, there, there are different games for different people. Uh, uh, there are different uh, levels of engagement that people may have. There are different availability of time uh, uh, for people uh, uh, to have. Candy Crush, like, uh, like I, I play Candy Crush when uh, I am like uh, um, in a break or when I am waiting for something or when I am waiting for a doctor's appointment or on the commute. Lots of people play that way. So it's really like a fun break um, uh, on your day. Uh, and maybe that's probably like one of the key reasons why uh, why people uh, love it so much. Fernando, you're known for a particular guerrilla style of marketing in your previous role at Burger King, the, the, the traffic jam whopper and the moldy whopper and all of that. Are we yeah, going to see? Are we going to see more of that approach at Activision Blizzard? Yeah. Look, I think that like the the the, the, the cool thing about Activision Blizzard is that it's a company that is in, incredibly successful. Uh, uh, with the games that we had and um, in an industry that's evolving very fast. One of the biggest uh, dangers like uh, when you have those conditions is that you just try to do what made you successful before, right? Because that's why you were successful to start with. But since the industry is changing a lot, maybe what made you successful before is not necessarily what's going to guarantee success in the future. Uh, and I think that everyone here realizes that so that's one thing. I think that the other thing is that when you have digital creativity in the franchises that we have, uh, like th the sky is the limit, right? I mean, you, like uh, you can do really like amazing things creatively. Uh, so we are always trying to push the boundaries here in terms of the creative and, and do things differently, whether it's uh, a, a different activity in streaming or a different way to launch a campaign or uh, or the blurring of the lines of the real world with the virtual world. Uh, and we've done uh, some of those things already and we will continue to do. It's beautiful to see that gaming today is much more always on. You know what I mean? Like It's not like when I was a kid and I would buy a game once a year and then I would wait for the next year to buy it again. Uh, here we are dropping content nonstop, right? I mean, because it's basically like uh, Warzone for Call of Duty. It's a venue. Uh, and we keep doing seasons and, and new characters uh, on Overwatch. We have Overwatch 2 coming now, which is going to be very popular. We are going to continue to drop new new heroes and new uh, maps. So it's constantly evolving, uh, which really gives us the opportunity to experiment, do different things. Uh, so hopefully um, we, we have already started to do some of that. You know, like uh, we did Vanguards of Photography, which was a really cool uh, activity. 
We did Scratch That Board uh, for Tony Hawk Pro Skater, which is a game from Activision, uh, which won, by the way, a gold uh, lion in Cannes this year. Um, uh, we are doing cool activities for uh, Candy Crush. Last year, we did a, a, a Candy Crush competition called Candy Crush All-Stars. So it's really like trying to push the franchises as entertainment properties and evolve the model uh, of advertising, communicating, or even like integrate into the product. Uh, so yeah, you, you're probably going to see more of that. Uh, uh, it's something that we will always push. It's, ne- it's not necessarily easy because as I said, we were very successful doing things a certain way, but I think that everyone understands that we need to continue to evolve our playbook. All right, let's come to India now. <laughs> is there an India-specific game in the works and what kind of game is it going to be? Like, I don't think there is, I, I don't think we'd have like uh, a specific work going on uh, to any specific country, uh, meaning like uh, we, we usually approach the games with like a, a global mindset. We launched Diablo Immortal, uh, which is doing well everywhere. Uh, uh, and there is no specific hero or specific approach or specific gameplay, uh, depending on the country you are in. Uh, we really want our games to be uh, uh, global uh, platforms. Um, so the same for Candy, the same for Overwatch 2, uh, which is coming, the same for World of Warcraft, we have two bits coming. And, and India is like a, a massive market, uh, and it is a market where we have a, a strong uh, a presence, but we don't have, uh, um, if I remember, I'm just thinking out loud here, Like, I don't think we have any specific activity to any individual market. We always try to do things uh, on a global scale. And maybe that's an opportunity there. Okay, final question, Fernando. What games are you playing right now? Oh, my God. Like, I'm I'm doing my my dream, which is, like, I I always love the idea of playing games that haven't been launched yet. So I'm playing Overwatch 2, uh, which is in beta, I think. I'm starting to play Diablo 4. Uh, which is a game that will only come next year. Um, I always play COD, Call of Duty, because like I, I like. Uh, those are the Activision Blizzard ones. Um, I have a seven-year-old. He loves Mario, so we play quite a bit of Mario, and we play Mario Strikers, we play Mario Golf. Uh, uh, we play all sorts of Mario. He's obsessed. All right. Fernando Machado of Activision Blizzard, thank you for talking to us at Melt. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Uh, hopefully we can connect again soon. Uh, hopefully a uh, pandemic will get behind us and uh, we'll be able to connect in person very soon too. I miss, I, I miss uh, visiting the team and, uh, and being able to keynote that melt. We miss you too. Country India soon. That's a wrap on this episode. You can follow Melt on social media. The handle is ready to melt or simply log on to readytomelt.com. If you'd like to follow me, it's at Suvink on Twitter. Till next week, goodbye and thanks for watching.